primary election day in Florida is just three weeks away. Stand by to meet the candidates. This original program is provided as a public service by WSRE, the League of Women Voters, and Pensacola State College. Good evening and welcome to Rally 2012. I'm Drexel Gilbert with WSRE TV. And I'm Sandra Averhart with WUWF Public Media. This is the first of three nights we will be with you for Rally 2012 election coverage on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Of course, over the next three nights, you will be meeting the candidates from primary races in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties, as well as candidates in the state races that impact these counties. The spotlight tonight is on the races for Okaloosa County, and we're going to begin with the race for Okaloosa County Sheriff, followed by the contest for tax collector and then superintendent of schools. We will then move on to the races for two county commission seats, District 3 and 5. We will finish the evening with the race for school board member, District 4. Now, tomorrow night, candidates from Santa Rosa County will be in our studios. We will cover the clerk of the court and county commissions, Districts 1, 3, and 5. We will also have the races for sheriff, superintendent of schools, and supervisor of elections. Then on Thursday night, we will cover state races for public defender, first judicial circuit, for state representative districts 2 and 3 and for circuit judge group 15. Now also on Thursday we will cover Escambia County races including clerk of circuit court, sheriff, county commissions 1, 3 and 5 and ECUA districts 1, 3 and 5. Now the questions that will be put before the candidates for the next three nights have been provided to us by the Pensacola Bay Area League of Women Voters and the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa County. Tonight's questions will come to us from the Okaloosa League. The candidates have not seen the questions. They will each be asked the same questions and they will have 45 seconds to respond. It's time now to get started with the questions for the candidates and we're going to begin Drexel this evening with the race for sheriff in Okaloosa County. There are four Republican candidates in the race for sheriff. There is no Democratic candidate in this race. Now, because this is a position that affects the entire population of Okaloosa County, this is what is known as a universal race. And what that means is that every registered voter in the county can vote in the sheriff's race, regardless of party affiliation. Also, because this is a universal race, it will be decided by plurality, meaning that the top vote getter on August 14th will be the winner in the race. Now, there are several Okaloosa County races that fall into this category this year. Our candidates are seated in alphabetical order. The first candidate we will introduce in the race tonight is Larry Ashley, and Mr. Ashley resides in Shalimar. The second candidate that we will introduce in the race tonight is A. Sheridan Lowry II. Mr. Lowry is from Destin in Okaloosa County. The next candidate in the race for Okaloosa County Sheriff is Stephen Menchel, and Mr. Menchel lives in the city of Destin in Okaloosa. Also, the fourth candidate running for sheriff in Okaloosa County's uh, race is Tony R. Taylor, and Mr. Taylor resides in the city of Fort Walton Beach. Now this evening, and for this first race in particular, Drexel and I will be alternating questions in this race, and I will begin, and Mr. Ashley, we will start with you with our first question. Uh, what, sir, what modification in Florida's stand your ground law would you like to see that would enable sheriffs throughout the state to handle claims of self-defense uniformly and more effectively? Sandra, great question. I was recently appointed to the governor's uh, Stand Your Ground Task Force or, or Public Safety. The, the, the Stand Your Ground law is a great law. The, the issue is clarification and interpretation across the state where it's being implemented and interpreted the same in Miami-Dade as it is in Tampa, as the same as it is in Jacksonville, the same as it is in Pensacola, and that how we apply the law. The, uh, the previous laws, you were obligated to flee if you could. The, the current law, you are allowed and you have the right to stand your ground. The modification that, that I would like to see in the law is to determining who is the determining body that's most responsible to determine the reasonable man standard. 
did I have the right to defend myself? Who determines that, law enforcement, prosecutor, or the judge? Thank you. All right, Mr. Lowry, this next, uh, the same question to you, I'll repeat it. What modification in Florida's stand your ground law would you like to see that would enable sheriffs throughout the state to handle claims of self-defense uniformly and more effectively? Absolutely, it's, uh, it's a unique question and unfortunately there's not a uniform answer. Uh, every situation where a citizen is presented with an element or a crime that's being perpetrated upon them and they make that choice to stand their ground under the current laws in the Florida statutes, they're afforded that right, obviously, uh, as a citizen to protect their properties. It's under the Constitution. So no two elements that arise are ever going to be the same. It's going to take the, the sheriffs and the prosecutors in each of the jurisdictions to be able to fundamentally understand the law, understand the U.S. Constitution, the Florida Constitution. It's not something that you can lie a blanket over and have a uniform application to make a determination. All right, thank you. Mr. Menchel, uh, about Florida's stand your ground law, what would you like to see to enable sheriffs to handle claims uniformly and effectively? As the other two candidates said, there is no one size fits all. Obviously, there's, every situation is unique and has to be judged unique. I, too, agree with the fact that the sheriff and the prosecutors need to work together. Hopefully, the governor's task force can, in fact, work in that direction to establish guidelines to help the sheriff and prosecutor identify exactly case by case. You can't have a law in this particular case that's a blanket thing that says if this happens it. Again, as I say, there is no one size fits all. So this has to be judged on its merit on a case by case basis with the judge and the prosecutors. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. Taylor, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I, I, I think I have it. Um, I don't see a lot of modification room in the law itself. What I see is that the prosecutors and the sheriffs or the police chiefs or the lo lo local law enforcement, uh, whatever the agency may be, working together to, to determine these factors when, whenever a, somebody claims uh, protection under the stand your ground law. Uh, the courts decide these things, not the law enforcement officers. I don't believe law enforcement officers should be involved in litigation or or into legislation of laws. When you have that much power where you can legislate the laws and enforce them at the same time, you don't have a democracy anymore. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to the second question, and this time we will start with you, Mr. Lowry. As sheriff, what would you do to fight street crime and gang problems as resources to do so become available? Um, uh, Drexel, great question, and, uh, and I truly believe that uh, a sheriff has a constitutional authority and the duty and obligation to get to the root cause of street crime. And, uh, and I truly believe that that is all going to revolve around illegal drugs. Illegal drugs is probably uh, the result of uh, many of your prisons being full and overcrowded. If we can eradicate drugs, and my pledge to the citizens of Okaloosa County is that I will eradicate illegal drugs from Okaloosa County. When we do that, we will eliminate the gangs, we will eliminate the street crimes because those are the things that are bred off from that particular legal activity. And so that is my commitment uh, to resolve the issues that we, we see in our communities that revolve around crime. All right, thank you. Mr. Uh, Menchel, I'll repeat the question for you. As sheriff, what would you do to fight street crime and gang problems as the resources to do so become available? One of the, one of the themes you're going to hear a lot tonight is a budget that obviously is shrinking. With my experience of 38 years as a federal law enforcement officer, I've had the occasion to work throughout the country on that exact problem. One of the things that we would certainly work on is looking at federal grants to bring in more money to actually get task force operation collaboratively working with different sheriff's offices and police departments throughout the area. Gangs don't necessarily just stay in Okaloosa. They may travel to Walton, they may travel to Escambia. So we need to share intelligence. We need to be proactive, go after the gangs with the resources that are available and actively, actively target these individuals. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, as resources become available uh, as sheriff, what would you do to fight the gang problem and the street crime problem? Well, I've had quite a bit of experience in my career with street-level crime, and it's not just limited to drugs. It's, it's prostitution, it's criminal mischief, it's uh, tagging, things like that. Uh, it's, it's a whole gamut of different uh, nuisance crimes uh, leading and, drug, and drugs. I uh, can't leave those out. But uh, what I've found is a universal approach 
to it. Uh, you can't concentrate on the one area where it's most prevalent. You have to concentrate universally throughout the, your jurisdiction to try and drive it out and, 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 and vet your, uh, these type of crimes from your community. And just one single approach doesn't work. We've even uh, employed just, well, when nothing else worked, just parking next to them and where they couldn't conduct their business. And when they moved, we moved with them. They finally left. All right, thank you. And Mr. Ashley, as uh, resources become available to do so, what would be your plans as sheriff to, um, after this election, to uh, fight the street crime and the gang problem? Well, as sheriff, what we've done, we, we have a number of operations, video operations, where we actually go out and, and purchase drugs from drug dealers and, and place them under arrest. We actually go and solicit uh, would-be prostitutes, and we place them under arrest. It's, it's a quality of life issue, and it's certainly prostitution is not a uh, victimless crime. The, uh, what we've also attacked is the bath salts and the spices and the synthetic drugs that are being sold to our youth and whom they think is being sold across the counter are safe drugs. We attack those. We seize not only the drugs, we, we arrest the seller, we arrest the owner of the store, and we will seize the entire store to prevent that poison from getting to our youth. We have to attack this head on, and the, when we become tolerant is when we have an issue. Thank you, gentlemen. The third question for our Okaloosa Sheriff's questions uh, or candidates tonight will go to Mr. Menchel. We'll start with you this time. Given the opportunity, what recommendations, if any, would you make to state or county officials relative to the purchase, registration, or carrying of handguns? As far as the law exists right now, I am good with the law, okay? I don't think we need any additional registration of firearms. Obviously, when an individual buys a firearm legally, they fill out ATF forms 4473. If they buy a used gun at a pawn shop, there's obviously a lot of documentation. There's obviously a check with the state before an individual buys a gun. There's a waiting period. I don't see the need in establishing any other paperwork in the purchase of a weapon other than what we have now. Obviously, as long as a weapon is purchased legally. All right, thank you. Mr. Taylor, this question to you next. What recommendations, if any, would you make to state or county officials relative to purchase, registration, or carrying of handguns? Absolutely none. Uh, the, the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States guarantees us the right to keep and bear arms, and I firmly believe in that. Uh, I've been raised uh, around weapons all my life. I've been trained with weapons. Obviously, all of us have. But I don't think uh, limit, limitations on that, uh, for other than what we have right now, are going to solve any other any problems in society. Uh, we're, uh, certainly when you do buy a gun, as long as it's uh, gained legally, I don't see a problem with what we have. All right, thank you. Mr. Ashley, to you now, uh, would you make any recommendations? What would you make to state or county officials relative to the purchase, registration, or carrying of handguns? Uh, none, with the exception of carry. And it's, it's specifically, we've had legislation that, uh, suggested about open carry. Um, I don't think we have a, a very good requirements for even obtaining a concealed weapon, though. We've offered free class while I've been sheriff to our citizens, and we want armed citizens, legal armed citizens, citizens that are, are uh, uphold the law. That means target acquisition. If I'm defending myself, I need to know if the school bus is behind me or if the McDonald's is over there. We need to know how to teach our citizens on, on weapon retention in case somebody's trying to take <laughs> their weapon. Teach them to better defend themselves. That's, that's the route that we're going at the sheriff's office now. All right, thank you. And finally, uh, this question to you, Mr. Lowry. Uh, reference uh, the purchase, registration, or carrying of handguns. What recommendations would you make to state or county officials? Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. I, I believe the laws are currently, both at the federal level and the state level, are adequate for the uh, acquisition and purchase. Where the, uh, the issue lies is, uh, it's been about two years ago, but uh, you had a uh, movement afoot in legislation which was proposed at Tallahassee for the open carry of weapons. The argument against that was actually uh, uh, presented by a sheriff of Okaloosa County that was sponsored to be there to speak to the committee that was considering that law. And uh, so that was the Sheriff Association for the state of Florida. They argued against it. The sheriff made a threat that if that law passed, his deputies would be drawing down on citizens. But what they failed to do is to mislead the voters and indicate that uh, there would be no prosecution of accidental um, viewing of a weapon. And that is not Thank true. You. All right, Jackson. All right, and now we're going to move on to question number four. And this time we will start with... Mr. Taylor? Okay. 
make sure I've got the right candidate here. <laughs> what unique contributions do you believe that the sheriff can make in programs that are aimed at bullying in schools, on the streets, and also in the workplace? Primarily education. Uh, if we uh, use our school resource programs to educate uh, not only the teachers but the students on, on the dangers and, and the ramifications of bullying, uh, we've seen several things in the news in the last few years uh, where these have actu actually ended tragically. And if we can just get some, some kind of training program in the schools to train these people on, 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 on how not to do this and, and how, to, uh, how to deal with it if it is done to them properly. That's, uh, I believe training is going to be the issue. All right, thank Education. you very much. Mr. Ashley, the question to you now, uh, what contributions do you believe that the Office of Sheriff can make and aimed at programs that are aimed at uh, controlling and taking care of the bullying issue? I mean, we, we hear about bullying in the workplace and on the streets and also in our schools. Our, our youth services program includes our school resource officers, but, but more programs as well. We, we are participating in, in sponsoring and uh, supporting uh, before and after school programs, tutoring, athletics, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA. We've got to get involved with our youth and give them an alternative to drugs, give them an alternative to bullying, and get and, and hold those bullies accountable. If, if little Johnny's taking lunch money or if little Johnny's, uh, you know, calling names, or especially the, the technical bullying where we're Skyping and, and uh, Facebook and uh, emails where, which create just an atmosphere where uh, someone may even commit suicide. We need to be involved and from the get, from the beginning. All right, thank you. And Mr. Lowry, the uh, problem of bullying, we hear about it all the time. As sheriff, what impact do you think the sheriff can have in programs that are aimed at stopping that? Yeah, programs obviously need to, to be done. There's no bigger mouthpiece as an elected sheriff, as a political official of the state. As such, if uh, the sheriff was uh, uh, actively, and I certainly would be promoting family values, conservative family values, to get back uh, to the family unit. The breakdown of the family unit in America has obviously resulted in the decay of many moral values and it's allowed children to believe that those kind of activities are okay and that there's no consequences for their actions. And so we would obviously use community leaders, we would use groups within the community to actively try to promote conservative family values in Okaloosa County. That's why I moved there and we would continue to do so. All right, thank you. And Mr. Mitchell, the question to you now about the problem of bullying. Uh, what do you believe that, uh, how, what kind of an impact can the sheriff have on programs that are aimed at curbing and stopping this? First of all, the sheriff can have a significant impact by virtue of the education at the schools. But above and beyond that, we need to reach out to our churches. We need to reach out to our universities. We have to educate the parents as well. We have to take a look at social media. Obviously, bullying takes on many, many forms. It's not just taking little Johnny's lunch money. It's nasty emails. It's whatever. So we have to really get out and educate the people. We can talk to our church groups, as I said, let them educate as well. And, and in so many other things, a lot of times in law enforcement, so many people fail to notify law enforcement because they say, they, we don't want to bother you. We didn't want to cry wolf. We need to ensure everybody that it's okay to let us know something about that so we can take appropriate action. So education takes on many, many forms. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Sandra? All right. Thank you, Drexel. For our fifth and uh, final question, we think, uh, for our sheriff's candidates tonight, we're back to you, uh, Mr. Ashley. And the question is, periodically we hear distressing reports on what seems to be the improper use of tasers by law enforcement officers. Please describe what you consider to be the appropriate policies governing use of tasers in Okaloosa County. Well, a taser is never to be used as a form of punishment. A, a taser is, is used to gain compliance and lawful compliance. And there's a, a use of force matrix that every officer is taught. And it's, they use that force which is necessary and only necessary. And so the, the, the taser has been a tool which actually has prevented uh, more serious injuries. You know, the baton of the days in the past where you're breaking bones to, to seek compliance, uh, the tasers prevented us from having to do that. And it's been proven safe time and time again. It is a very painful five second ride, but uh, once that ride is over and, and handcuffs are put on, then that, that subject's in compliance. And uh, so there will be no use of that, that tool as a punishment. All right, thank you. Mr. Lowry, to you, please describe what you consider to be the appropriate policies governing use of tasers in Okaloosa County. Yeah, there are uh, appropriate uh, times where uh, that non-lethal form 
uh, of compliance can be met. Uh, the problem that we have in Okaloosa County is that you do have uh, officers which are abusing that. Uh, there's been a recent incident with an African-American uh, individual who was tased while in handcuffs. He had already uh, been placed under arrest. Uh, there's another incident uh, actually in the Crestview uh, Jail, the Okaloosa County Jail, where an uh, inmate uh, was actually strapped in a chair, handcuffed and restrained, and then tased. Um, it's, it's appalling that anyone would be tased after being handcuffed and placed into custody. I would seek to ferret out anyone that would abuse that and remove them from any law enforcement position. We, Mr. Ashley would like to re have a rebuttal, but we will first hear from all the candidates and then we'll come back to you. All right, Mr. Mitchell, this question to you, um, or this thought, if you would, uh, describe what you consider to be the appropriate policies governing the use of tasers. A taser obviously is a non-lethal weapon. Obviously it can save lives in lieu of, if a, if a violator would pull a knife, in, in lieu of breaking their bones, in lieu of shooting them. Obviously it is a tool now that has allowed law enforcement obviously to take somebody into custody without lethal, lethal force. Obviously we would only allow it under, on a case by case basis. There would be a review process any time an officer uses it, just like they, when they fire a weapon, we would review that and take appropriate action if it was done wrong. Like so many other things, training is paramount. Obviously, we have to have reoccurring training on that, just like firearms, just like any other thing. But bottom line is, is that it's a way to save lives and not injure somebody in using lethal force. Right, thank you. And finally, uh, this question to you, Mr. Taylor, describe what you consider the appropriate policies governing the use of tasers. Well, actually, I've written policy on the use of tasers for the Fort Wall Beach Police Department and I've conducted investigations on the misuse of tasers. Uh, in the same department. We, uh, it's a, t taser is a wonderful tool. It's a five second ride, it's a very painful ride, but it does, does bring compliance. It could, but it, it's not an, an, uh, an overall effective uh, tool other than just a break in combat is what it is. And it should never be used uh, short of active physical resistance. Uh, tasing handcuffed suspects uh, or, or even pregnant women or children is just not acceptable. And we have a, we have a very stringent policy at the Fort Wall Police Department uh, on the use of tasers. All right, thank you. And uh, now back to Mr. Ashley for your rebuttal, 30 seconds. It's just, it won't even take that. There, there is no, no case in Okaloosa County where the Sheriff's Office has tased an individual who is in handcuffs. Our office is not investigating or nor have they investigated nor have we received a complaint of such. Just wanted to refute that point. All right, thanks. Okay, and that concludes the questions now for uh, the candidates for sheriff in Okaloosa County. And now each candidate is going to have 45 seconds to make a closing statement. And uh, we're going to continue our pattern of moving down the line. So, Mr. Lowry, we will start with you. 45 seconds for your closing statement, sir. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen of Okaloosa County, I am your conservative Christian Republican candidate for sheriff. I'm seeking the office of sheriff so that we can restore liberty and the justice for all, not select few, but all. I will faithfully protect your children. I will faithfully protect your elderly. I will protect your family values and I will promote every day of my life to ensure that the Constitution is upheld and that the laws are not overreaching or overbearing. I ask for your vote on August 14th so that we can bring civility and peace back to Okaloosa County and save many lives, and I will eradicate drugs from Okaloosa County once and for all. All right, and now to you, Mr. Mitchell, with your closing statement. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning into this program. I ask each of you to take a look at my website, MenchelForSheriff.com. Do your due diligence and really examine the qualifications of the candidates. When you look at the qualifications, you'll see that I have 38 years of law enforcement experience that obviously encompasses more than just Okaloosa County. We have a candidate with zero years law enforcement experience and zero years geographic area responsibility in law enforcement operations. We have another candidate with over 30 years of law enforcement experience and 8.2 ge geographic miles of experience. We have a third candidate with 20 plus years of experience with 1,082 square miles and I have 38 years experience with over 3,747,000 miles of geographic experience in Thank law you. enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Taylor, 45 seconds for your closing statement. Yes, ma'am. 
I have lived over in Okaloosa County for over 40 years. I've been with the Fort Long Beach Police Department for over 35 years. Over 24 years of that has been a supervision and executive management of law enforcement officers. I bring to the table uh, accomplished accreditation management uh, as the manager of the accreditation process for the Fort Long Beach Police Department. Uh, 45 seconds is not a lot of time, but please visit my website, TonyRTaylorForSheriff.com, and you'll see a candidate comparison out there where we've taken and we've compared all the candidates in this race across the board on the issues that have been expressed to me as the most important in talking to people as I knock on their doors in the communities. And you will see that I'm a consummate professional. I've been in Okaloosa County for over 40 Thank years. Thank you, sir. And now, Mr. Ashley, 45 seconds for your closing statement. As your current sheriff, I've served over 25 years, nearly a quarter of a century, at the sheriff's office under three different sheriffs. The only candidate here that's ever worked in the sheriff's office. I've worked in patrol, investigations, and management, and as, under, as the chief deputy. The uniqueness in that, the, the first Okaloosa County deputy to have worked their way up through the ranks to become sheriff in, our, in the history of our county, it put, puts me in a unique position to lead the agency. And as sheriff, vote August 14th. Please visit my website. And uh, I think you'll, you'll be happy that, that Okaloosa County has the lowest per capita cost, one of the lowest in the country. All right. Thank you. A little Thank tongue you, tied there. And as we wrap up the first question and answer session of the evening, we want to remind you that you are watching Rally 2012 on WSRE TV, where candidates in the upcoming primary have the opportunity to answer questions that uh, were prepared for us by the League of Women Voters from Okaloosa County and also the Pensacola Bay Area. We have several more races ahead of us this evening. We will return in just a moment, but for now, a look at those upcoming races. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on election day. Good evening, I'm Ed Meadows, president of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning in to Rally 2012, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV, and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community and state. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in this upcoming election. And welcome back to Rally 2012 on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. This is the first of three nights where we will be introducing you to candidates in Escambia and Santa Rosa and Okaloosa counties. The candidates will be asked a series of questions provided to us by the League of Women Voters from the Pensacola Bay Area and also from um, Okaloosa County. And uh, I wanted to just reintroduce uh, the two of us to you again. I'm Drexel Gilbert and Sandra Aberhart is with me tonight. And uh, we're going to have a good night and a good three nights of previewing the primary election. I'm glad to be here and to be here with you and I'm um, looking forward to it. Our next race uh, this evening is for tax collector in Okaloosa County. There are two Republican candidates and no candidates from other parties. So this again is a universal race, meaning all registered voters in Okaloosa County may cast a vote in the race and that's regardless of party affiliation. Now, and the top vote getter at the end of the day will be the winner of the election. All right, our two candidates for tax collector are, and we will introduce them in alphabetical order, Mr. Ben Anderson, and uh, Mr. Anderson resides in Fort Walton Beach, and our second candidate in the race for tax collector is Mr. Bill Roberts, and he is from Fort Walton Beach as well. Welcome to you both, Thank gentlemen. You. All right, just one second here. I think I've got my questions kind of covered up in the pile. All right, 
Now to the questions, and we'll go in alphabetical order, so we'll begin with you, Mr. Anderson. First question, what should the tax collector do to evaluate customer satisfaction with their office visits, office locations, and hours of service? Well, we are currently doing that. Uh, we uh, request each uh, customer that does come in and taxpayer that uh, they complete uh, a sheet that gives an evaluation of how that agent provided service. It also asks for other convenient ways that we can provide additional service. Also on our website, we have a place for people to make responses to what they might recommend as to how we can improve the services that we have. It's working very well we find that there are really better ideas that come from the citizens than those that we assume. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Roberts, that question to you. What should the tax collector do to evaluate customer satisfaction with their office visits, office locations, and hours of service? Well, first of all, the most important uh, aspect of the job is providing good service to the citizens of Okaloosa County. I think my background experience in sales as a small business owner I understand the importance of serving the customer and serving the customer properly and efficient, efficiently. Uh, we will conduct our surveys to make sure the locations are handling the customers in a timely manner and also that those locations are convenient to everybody in our county. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Roberts, this question to you first. Some critics say that recent events in the tax collector's office demonstrate the need for the county to exercise greater oversight of the tax collector's expenditures. How do you respond to those who call for this increased oversight? You know, the, the tax collector's budget is approved by the Department of Revenue. Uh, it is given to the county commissioners uh, to have a look at it, and if there are any discrepancies that the commissioners see, they can contact the Department of Revenue with those discrepancies. Uh, in fact, we had our first budget workshop today. I sit as a county commissioner, uh, and I think there should be more transparency. Even though we don't approve that budget, I think we should see more than a one-page budget presented by the tax collector's office to the commissioners so we can better understand and better calculate how these budgets are, are spent. All right, thank you. And Mr. Anderson, your response to the charge that uh, recent events in the tax collector's office demonstrate the need for the county to exercise greater oversight of the tax collector's expenditures. How do you respond to this call for increased oversight? Well, first, I'm not aware of any recent events that uh, do ask for a review of the tax collector's budget. It's important to know that we do post our entire budget and review and summaries on our website. We feel like the most important place to have that answerable is to the citizens. And yes, it is a good balance and checks and balance in government that the Department of Revenue does ask for the county commissioners to provide input into the budget. So we're delighted to work with a checks and balance system within the county, but most importantly throughout the year, we seek and ask and we provide a copy of our budget to the citizens on our website. All right, thank you. If you're just tuning in, this is Rally 2012, and we're talking to the candidates for tax collector in Okaloosa County, and we're the questions tonight, I did want to remind our viewers of that, come from the Okaloosa County League of Women Voters. All right, now, our next question, and we'll go to you first, Mr. Okay. Anderson. How detailed should the budget the tax collector submits uh, to the county and its residents, how detailed do you think it has to be or should be? The tax collector's budget that we do submit is a budget that is requested and provided by the Department of Revenue. It has summary pages and then it has addendum pages that break out the categories. It has it primarily in three categories with personnel, operational expense, and capital outlay. I do think for the citizens it is available to go into further detail, but most importantly we operate with an open door policy. If there are questions about our operation, questions about our capital outlay that we do, we're available to answer those questions, whether it be from the citizens or from the Department of Revenue. All right, thank you. And Mr. Roberts, to you, how detailed do you think the tax collector's budget should be, the one that's presented to the county and the citizens, the residents? I think it should be very uh, detailed. Uh, their budget in the past hasn't been very transparent. Uh, they do put their budget online after the budget has been approved by the Department of Revenue. Again, I'll say today at our budget workshop, uh, the budget presented to us was a one-page statement from the tax collector's office. 
uh, there's too much information that needs to be addressed before the budget's approved, not after the fact. Okay, rebuttal. Mr. Anderson. Yes, um, the tax collector's office today, we did not make a presentation to that budget. Uh, I believe what Mr. Roberts is referring to was a June preliminary discussion we had with the county administrator. At the request of the current chairman of the Okaloosa County Board of Commissioners, our budget discussion has been postponed and set for August 7th after we submit our complete and entire budget to the Department of Revenue. All right, thank you, sir. All right, we're up to our, uh, yes, Can rebuttal from Mr. Rebuttal? Roberts. It, it was not at the request of the chairman of the board. It was at Mr. Anderson's request uh, not to be at that first public hearing of the budget workshop today. All right, thank you. Now, Mr. Roberts, this next question will go to you first. What improvements, if any, would you consider appropriate in security, accountability, and transparency for the quarter billion dollars in taxes and fees that flow through this office each year? Well, of course, transparency uh, in the difficult times we faced in that office in the past is a, is a, is a big key on how we present ourselves to the public. Uh, security with a with a proper proper functions in place uh, you know there are the statutory requirements that we have to follow we have to follow those in a timely and efficient manner uh, I think my management skills in private business and in the public sector will help me manage those and lead by example in that office all right thank you and mr. Anderson uh, your thoughts here what improvements if any would you consider appropriate in security accountability and transparency for the quarter billion dollars in taxes and fees that flow through this office well this is something that must constantly be reviewed and checked for proper checks and balance throughout the process we do receive over a quarter of a million dollars a year and those funds come in the front door, we process them through our county department, and then they are sent out timely and delivered to all the taxing authorities. We are constantly monitoring within, and we're prepared to work at setting additional checks and balances in place throughout the entire process. This is constantly in view and review, and it will continue as such. All right, thank you. And Mr. Roberts, uh, I think, no, we talked to both of you about that question. Next question. Now, the tax collector is concerned with a ride, uh, wide variety of functions, as well as government organizations in carrying out the duties of the office. What steps must the tax collector take to assure that staff has the information and training needed to perform these duties efficiently and effectively? Mr. Roberts, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson, to you first. Uh, as you mentioned, we do represent the taxing authorities of the county and we do receive funds for the fire districts, but also an important service that we provide is through the state offices. <coughs> and we are working with the state uh, in education programs through the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Department of Driver's License, hunting and fishing, and then additionally there are courses that are provided by the Tax Collectors Association that are provided by the Department of Revenue. So we are working and constantly reviewing the changes in the statutes, but furthering the education. But to carry it a step further, we have implemented a Department of Professional Development within our office so that all employees will be okay, that's your time. educated. Thank you. Uh, and to you, Mr. Anderson, what steps must the tax collector take to assure that staff has the information and training needed to perform their duties efficiently and effectively? Mr. Roberts. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's Mr. All Roberts. Right. Training is a key. You know, you've got to take advantage of, of all types of training. One of the responsibilities given to the tax collector's office across the state are the issuance of driver's license, uh, and, and, and probably the most burdensome effort of those clerks is to try to get, try to get somebody through on a new issuance of a license as efficiently as possible. Training is free from the state of Florida. We need to take advantage of that training so we can cut down the wait times in those offices. Uh, Training has to follow technology. It's too expensive today to send people all over the state. You must use Skype. You must use all kind of programs to make the efficiencies work in that office. All right, thank you. And that concludes the questions for the candidates for tax collector in Okaloosa County. Now each of the candidates will have 45 seconds to make a closing statement. And this time, Mr. Roberts, we will begin thank with you. you. 45 seconds. 
I'm running on my record, 18 years of, as a public servant, 31 years as a small business owner, and a lifetime community servant. My record is an open book, a book of trust and commitment. When the scandals hit the tax collector's office with huge bonuses paid to favored employees, how did my opponent respond when appointed by Tallahassee? He named those same employees to his management staff and then said nothing illegal had occurred in that office. I think it's time you elect somebody that understands the difference between right and wrong. During this campaign, I've been attacked by special interest groups and Tallahassee powers who appointed and fund my opponent. On, on August 14th, tell these power brokers you've had enough of this deception. Vote Bill Roberts. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now, Mr. Anderson, 45 seconds for your closing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you for tuning in to this evening. Eleven months ago, Governor Scott appointed me to step in, make tough decisions in your tax collector's office. Took seven weeks and, and evaluated the entire staff and the office and procedures. We concluded that with an audit, a forensic audit of this office, and then we moved forward. Very positive changes and directions we've implemented, including cost savings at every level, Every day, we find ways to save money. Secondly, technology. We are driving technology so that in the future, you'll be able to do business online, on time, at your convenience. And we are making the differences. Please vote. Ben Anderson, allow us to continue serving you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And that concludes our look at the tax collector race for Okaloosa County. And Sandra, I think now might be a good time to, for viewers that may have just joined us, to let you know that each of the candidates tonight will be asked five questions, the same five questions per race. Uh, they will have 45 seconds to respond, and then they will also have 45 seconds to make a closing statement. And uh, we have a lot coming up, so we hope that you'll stay right here. Right now, we're going to take a look at the races still ahead this evening on Rally 2012 on WSRE. Thanks for watching this year's rally event on WSRE TV. I'm Rosemary Hayes Thomas. Dr. Paula Montgomery and I serve as co presidents of the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. For over 20 years, the leagues here and in Okaloosa County have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. Our democracy is based on active participation by informed citizens, and voting is an important way to participate. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan, which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of the amendments, merit retention of judges, and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or to join us as members of the League. Please see our website for more information or to contact us. And please, remember to be an informed voter this year. And welcome back to Rally 2012 as we count down to the Florida primary election, which is coming up in just three weeks. It will be held on August the 14th. I'm Drexel Gilbert here tonight with Sandra Averhart. And for the next three nights, you will have the opportunity to hear from candidates and races in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties. Tonight we are focusing on the contest in Okaloosa County and the next race up is that for superintendent of schools. Now there are two Republican candidates in this race. It is also a universal race, meaning that all registered voters in the county can cast a vote in this race regardless of party affiliation and the winner of the primary will win the office. The candidates are seated once again in alphabetical order as they will be throughout the evening. The first candidate in the race for superintendent of schools is Mary Beth Jackson, and Ms. Jackson is from Baker. The second candidate in the race for superintendent of schools is from Shalimar, and she is Ms. Alexis uh, G. C. Tibbetts. And we have uh, the first question for you this evening, the candidates. Uh, to what extent would teacher, should teacher testing be based on student performance? And the question goes to you first, Ms. Jackson. Teacher testing or teacher evaluation? Uh, te the question is written, to what extent should teacher testing be based on student test performance? Teacher pay. 
teacher pay. Oh, teacher pay. Oh, <laughs> thank you. My mistake. I'm That's so sorry. That's okay. That. Thank, thank you. you. I think it's very important that there's an accountability measure for everyone, and that includes our teachers. Student performance is one of those things that we could use. However, I believe there are so many uncontrollable variables that are involved when you are using student testing. My thought is to have more of a portfolio approach where it would be several samples of things over a period of time, not just a single test on a single day. That limits that very much for the teacher, and I really do feel like it probably is an unfair uh, situation. Thank you. Now the question goes to Ms. Tibbetts. To what extent should teacher pay be based on student test performance? Beginning uh, with this year, teachers are required in the state of Florida under Senate Bill 736 for us to have three years of teacher uh, performance based on student growth in their classes. The problem with the value added measure, as it is called, is that it is based primarily on progress. That can be a plus in terms of the fact that students are evaluated from where the teacher gets them to where they move forward. Uh, any kind of program to to uh, pay teachers based on student proficiency is a very unfair system and also we must find evaluation systems that match the, pro the uh, coursework of that teacher. All right, thank you. The next question, given adequate resources, what additional steps would you recommend for keeping the school district competitive and attracting and retaining highly qualified teachers? This time the question goes first to you, Ms. Tibbetts. Okaloosa County Schools is highly competitive. We have many teachers uh, applying for jobs in our district. As you know, we are ranked at the top of the school districts in the state of Florida. We've been recognized as an A-plus district since 2004, and we have all A schools in our district with the exception of three. Recruiting and retaining teachers is important, but we have great teachers because we have the fifth highest paid teachers in the state of Florida. I think what Florida has to do, though, is decide to put their money into public education if they want to retain the best schools nationally and have our students be competitive internationally. All right, thanking the question now to you, Ms. Jackson. Given adequate resources, what additional steps would you recommend for attracting and retaining highly, qu highly qualified teachers in the Okaloosa County School District? With adequate we resources, we're able to pay our teachers a fair salary. However, when I think of teachers, I think that they are the type of people who appreciate and who expect things other than just a paycheck. They need excellent professional development. They need to be involved in the decisions that are being made in the school district, particularly in their own school and collaboratively throughout the district. I know that we are at this point in our district suffering from quite a bit of teacher burnout. I hear from them quite frequently. I believe that retaining our teachers is more than just about money. It's about appreciating them and valuing them. All right, thank you. Uh, the third question in this set of questions, end of course test. Add another layer of testing for students in many grade levels. How do you assess the importance that this additional measure of student performance? And the question goes to you first this time, Ms. Jackson. And of course, exams for us this year in Okaloosa County were um, a fiasco. We had exams that were produced by a, a group that had never produced exams before. And unfortunately, 24,000 of those scores had to be thrown out, and now we're back to square one. When you ask me about an additional layer of testing, I'm one of those folks who believes that it isn't all about the test. I go back to the fact that testing is important, but portfolios for students who can produce and be successful outside of the testing arena I think are very, very important and we need to provide those students those types of opportunities as well as a test. Okay, and now to you, Ms. Tibbetts, the question again, end of course test, add another layer of testing for students in many levels. How do you assess the importance of this additional uh, measure of student performance? 
Well, it's very important because end of course exams are now required by state law statutorily to graduate from high school. If you're a rising eighth grader, you must pass an end of course exam in Algebra One, Biology, American History, Chemistry, Physics, and several other courses. We have, just as we have regent exams these end of in New York, these end of course exams are required in Florida now. And the importance of these is that we provide students with the skills and the mastery of the standards to pass these tests because it's a moral imperative that our children get a high school diploma and move on to career and college readiness. And that's required of EOCs. Okay, Ms. Jackson, you raised your hand for a rebuttal. You have 30 seconds. Unfortunately, this year, our students were required to take these tests, and they were not mandated to be taken this year. The only ones that were mandated were biology, geometry, and algebra. In doing so, we rushed ahead, and in rushing ahead, I am concerned about the damage that this has done to the morale of our teachers, our students. I'm concerned that some of our students were not given the chance to take a fair and valid test. Okay, and Ms. Tibbetts, uh, you would like to rebut? You have 30 seconds. Thank you. Without allowing our students to practice before they actually go into the game, which in a year from now they will be required to start passing these end of course exams, and two years from now a national exam park, we would not be doing the right thing for students. You practice, you scrimmage before you play the game. Our students need to practice higher, more rigorous, more cohesive and coherent exams before they're required to take them for the high stakes of high school graduation. All right, now we're on to question number four. With sufficient resources, what should the school district do to measure the effectiveness of charter schools and of other approved alternative educational opportunities? And the question goes first to you, Ms. Tibbetts. We have excellent charter schools in Okaloosa County and we work very well with Liza Jackson and our collegiate school and our academy. I believe that with adequate resources, all schools can do great things for children, and Okaloosa County takes care of our children. We will continue to work with them, both with our help in facilities, capital, as well as we uh, assist them with uh, all types of curriculum, the professional development that is outstanding in our district that our teachers have. We include our charter school teachers with that because I know many of our feeder patterns with charter schools ramp those students up into our high schools. So with sufficient funding, I think all kids are successful. Thank you. And the question now to you, Ms. Jackson, with sufficient resources, what should the school district do to measure the effectiveness of charter schools and other approved alternative educational opportunities? I agree that with adequate funding, most programs can be very successful. But the question was, how do we measure the success of those programs? It has to be on an apples to apples basis. If we want to determine if, if a particular charter school is doing as well teaching math, science, language arts, they should be required to take the same exams that our students do. Furthermore, when we talk about charter schools in our district, we are very blessed to have some excellent charter schools. However, I do know that they have not been as included as one might lead you to believe. There are far more things we can do to include them. All right, and if you are just joining us, a reminder that you are watching Rally 2012, and tonight we are hearing from candidates in races in Okaloosa County as we approach the Florida primary election, which will be held in three weeks on August the 14th. We are right now uh, posing questions to the candidates for superintendent of schools in Okaloosa County. We are down to our last question now, and that question will go first to Ms. Jackson, and it is, how satisfied are you with the availability and the quality of substitute teachers in Okaloosa Lusa County, and if you believe there are deficiencies, what are your ideas for improvement? That's an excellent question, because oftentimes we do have a teacher that has to be gone for an extended period of time. I personally believe that our substitute teachers need more training. They need more training in how to handle the classroom management situation. And if they are going to be there for an extended period of time, I think they need to be partnered with an experienced teacher to help them move on in the curriculum. 
Substitute teaching is one of the hardest jobs you will ever do because students are always going to be testing you each time you come in. However, I believe that there needs to be a systematic training system for our substitute teachers. All right, thank you. And the last question now will be posed to you, Ms. Tibbetts. How satisfied are you with the availability and the quality of substitute teachers in Okaloosa County? If you believe there are deficiencies, what are your ideas for improvement? I'm extremely satisfied with the availability of our substitutes. We have over a thousand substitutes on our sub roles. We even had to uh, eliminate uh, some of the older uh, applications and make sure we had room for new ones. We have many subs that are trained as a former principal of a large comprehensive high school, Fort Walton Beach High School. We knew our subs. We had permanent subs that were well qualified. Many of our substitutes have undergraduate degrees and they are committed. I was a substitute a lot. My husband was active duty military, graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, Academy. We moved around a lot and I know what it's like to sub and we have awesome subs in Okaloosa County. All right, thank you candidates. And now each of the candidates is going to have 45 seconds to make a closing statement and we are going to begin with Ms. Tibbetts. Thank you very much for having us here this evening. I appreciate you tuning in. We uh, are proud to be uh, in a great school system. I am a lifelong resident of Okaloosa County and a product of that school system. As I just said, uh, I'm married to a retired military officer. Okaloosa County has the highest ACT scores in the state of Florida and the lowest dropout rate. We have the fifth highest paid teachers and we also have the most money of the top three counties spent in our classrooms in our uh, Okaloosa County School District. We have the third lowest administrative uh, expenditures and I will continue to bring excellence to this county even on based on reduction of dollars. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now we go to Ms. Jackson for your closing statement. You have 45 seconds. My number one priority as a teacher will be to raise the student achievement of our most struggling students. Those students can become more costly to us in the long run. We can either pay up front or pay later. I am a huge proponent of career and technical education. I am the director, program director of career and technical education. I want every student in Okaloosa County to walk across that stage in June with a diploma and a marketable skill. I also want to reopen honest, clear communication with our schools, with our principals, with our parents, with our students. And last of all, no new taxes. I will not, like my opponent, propose a half cent sales tax. All right, thank you. And those were the candidates for Superintendent of Schools in Okaloosa County. Now that's yet another universal race. And Sandra, we've been talking about that. And what that means is that every registered voter in Okaloosa County is eligible to vote in the race for Superintendent of Schools, regardless of party affiliation. It also means that this race is going to be decided August 14th, as there are no opposing party challengers. Well, in just a moment, Drexel, we will move on to two county commission races for candidates for District 3 and 5. They will be here to answer questions. You are watching Rally 2012 here on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Okaloosa County by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, contact the Okaloosa County Supervisor of Elections Office. You can write, phone, fax, email, or log on to their website. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections offices by 7 p.m. on election day. Early voting takes place from Saturday, August 4th through Saturday, August 11th at the four locations that are listed on your screen. Hours for early voting are 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. on Wednesday and Saturday, and 11 a.m. until 5 on Sunday. On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 14th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Make sure you take along a photo and signature ID with you. 
And welcome back to Rally 2012. I'm Drexel Gilbert, joined tonight with Sandra Averhart, and uh, we're meeting candidates from races in the Okaloosa County primary election this evening. And up next, Drexel, is uh, for County Commission District 3. There are four Republican candidates, and now this is also, as we've been talking about tonight, a universal race, meaning it is open to all registered voters in the county, regardless of their party affiliation. And it's time now to meet the candidates for the District 3 County Commission seat. We are going to begin with Clint Aiden, and uh, we're, he is in the first seat. We're going to be moving alphabetically. Mr. Aiden is from Fort Walton Beach, and seated next to him is candidate Nathan Boyles, who is from Holt. In the next chair is candidate Dennis A. Reeves, who is from Fort Walton Beach. And next to him is candidate Bill Smith, who is from Niceville. And gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Now, Drexel and I will alternate asking the questions in this race. A reminder that these questions have been uh, completed or compiled by a committee of the Okaloosa County League of Women Voters. And we will begin with you, Mr. Aiden. Our first question to you, and it is, what additional incentives would you like to see the county offer as part of its job growth and economic development programs? Uh, the primary thing that I would like to see is continual improvement uh, from the perspective of large commercial projects. Um, many of these businesses come here to Okaloosa County. People want to live in Okaloosa County, but the key is to have shovel-ready, buildable projects so that when these businesses come to town, they're ready to start building immediately so that they can open their business basically let our government stand out of the way and let these businesses come forward. All right, next to you, Mr. Boyles, uh, what additional incentives would you like to see the county offer uh, as part of its job growth and economic development programs? I think we have to be very realistic that we have to be aggressive and competitive here in Northwest Florida. We all know that uh, we're competing with Alabama and uh, other counties throughout, uh, throughout the Southeast to, to bring good jobs for our citizens. And so I think that considering the potential for tax abatements for good uh, job producers will bring high paying jobs is critical. I also think that having a streamlined permit process in place so that we can provide for uh, the efficient processing of those companies uh, w when they're ready to move to Okaloosa County, make that move and create jobs as a way to incentivize them to come here and bring those, bring those jobs to our citizens. All right. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Uh, this question to you. In terms of additional incentives you'd like to see the county offer as part of job growth and economic development? I would like to see out of the $262 million county budget, I would like to see a portion of that be able to set aside that when there are large employers that want to relocate to Okaloosa County, that we have something in Okaloosa County directly for them. We don't have to always run to Tallahassee to look for incentives. I think that the quickness and speed of permitting and also that money to actually have available is what some of our other neighboring states have available, and it's something that we could do locally with a budget as large as $262 million. All right, thank you. And this first question finally to you, Mr. Smith. What additional incentives would you like to see the county offer? I think it's very important that the county have a plan in place. Uh, these opportunities come along and you have to be ready. You have to have a grocery list of those things available to offer these, uh, these groups to, uh, to, uh, to capture the moment when it's available. Uh, things through the EDC, tax, uh, tax avoidance situations, uh, incentives that we can do use to draw these people in but it's not something you can put together. Uh, you need, those things need to be put together bef before the opportunity comes so you'll be ready to take advantage of the opportunities when the people, people come knocking. All right, thank you. Okay, and it's time now for the second question to be posed to these candidates. Gentlemen, it has been estimated that the county will have a $4 million shortfall in the coming fiscal year. What spending cuts or revenue enhancements do you believe the county should adopt to make up for that shortfall? And this time the question will go first to Mr. Boyles. First of all, regarding revenue enhancements, I, I don't envision supporting any revenue enhancements for Okaloosa County. I think that uh, we have a, a very, very low millage rate, and I expect that we'll want to keep it that way. I think the county government right now, given the um, the strain that all taxpayers are under, does not need to be looking at revenue increase increases, but instead we need to be looking at how we tighten the belt. And uh, doing so uh, through uh, consolidation of services, uh, working jointly with municipalities. One excellent example is through the process of uh, the 
the purchasing department. Okaloosa County has a, a very strong purchasing department, and we've seen that when we combine forces with uh, other municipalities uh, within the county, we can save, uh, save money for taxpayers through economy of scale, looking for ways uh, like that to creatively save money. All right, thank you. And the question now goes to um, Mr. Reeves. It has been estimated that the county will have a $4 million shortfall in the coming fiscal year. The question is, what spending cuts or revenue enhancements do you believe the county should adopt to make up for that shortfall? Well, there are many ways that the county can not only improve the revenues that, that come from their enterprise funds through streamlining some of that operation, but I, uh, specifically, we'd have to wait till we get a little bit closer into that budget. The four, the $4 million, though, to me, f sounds like a pretty small amount in a budget as large as $262 million. With, but, they, but we need to start beginning that practice now because revenues are, I think, for the foreseeable future, either going to remain flat or continue to drop off. So the practice of shrinking those is going to have to continue to be looked at every budget cycle for the time being. All right, thank you. And Mr. Smith, it is anticipated that there will be a $4 million shortfall in the, uh, in the, next, uh, in the budget in the next fiscal year. What spending cuts do, or revenue enhancements do you believe should be adopted by the county in order to counteract that? Uh, I'm a strong believer that, uh, that you should live within the main, your means. Uh, I can't support any additional uh, taxes or increased revenue in reference to that. Uh, it's, it's something that we have to work and we have, if cooperating with other cities and, and other municipalities to, uh, to share functions, to, uh, to save, uh, save the money that we do have. But as far as uh, increasing taxes, I cannot support that. We have to learn, like everybody else, to live within their means. All right, thank you. And Mr. Aiden, in anticipation of a $4 million shortfall um, in the coming year, in the coming fiscal year, what spending cuts or revenue enhancements do you believe that the county should adopt in order to make up for that shortfall? And I'm in agreement as well that uh, revenue increases are not what we need to do. We need to look at spending cuts. Uh, one area that we can look at specifically would be the Emergency Operations Center. Um, Currently, there are nearly 50 uh, emergency operators that are similarly trained, that could be cross-trained um, to respond. It was put forth by a previous sheriff's administration, and uh, there was approximately a million dollars in savings there that was not adopted. Uh, relying on these department heads to help us find ways to work with uh, other departments is what we're going to need to do. We're going to need to put pressure on those department heads and say, how can we work together to save the county money? All right, thank you. And we're now to question number three. And Mr. Reeves, we'll start with you first. What additional oversight, if any, would you recommend county commissioners exercise to achieve appropriate supervision and control of the Tourist Development Council's operations and expenditures? Well, I think a lot of those things are going to be done before we probably take our office at the at the at that county level. Uh, I think they're making the changes that need to be done by having more control directly supervising the administrator's position where all the trouble came from. Uh, so we're actually enacting some things in some of the boards at Okaloosa Gas that I'm involved with, learning from some of the shortfalls that came in that transparency and some of the things that happened in the TDC, which I'm, is what we're speaking of. Uh, I think that they're heading in the right direction, so I don't think many changes will be made by us, but just continuing to move that process forward and making sure that those safe, safety checks and balances are in place. All right, thank you. And Mr. Smith, that question to you. What additional oversight would you recommend county commissioners exercise to achieve appropriate supervision and control of the TDC's operations and budgets? I agree that the, uh, the county is definitely heading in the right direction. A lot of things have been enacted to, uh, to ensure additional control. Uh, the thing that you've got to understand is that uh, bills cannot be paid off of a three sentence description for $750,000. You need a lot more than that. I've spent the last 20 years of my life dealing with public dollars. Uh, you must have a detailed description of what you're getting so you'll know when you've gotten it so you know when you can pay for it. I think the county has made a lot of progress in that direction in getting some things in place uh, to ensure that the uh, protection of the taxpayers' dollars is, are, are in place. All right, thank you. Mr. Aiden, it is your turn. Uh, in terms of oversight that you might want to recommend to county commissioners uh, to achieve appropriate supervision and control over the TDC's operations sure. and expenditures. 
Well, multiple signatures would be one thing um, and a maximum spending limit, which has now been enacted by our county commissioners. Uh, frankly, I'd like to see that amount lowered. Uh, county commissioners with the TDC now don't get involved till expenditures are over $50,000. Um, that's one thing. And also verifying the actual uh, goods are pr produced. In the case of the TDC, a lot of times those things were not verified that they were actually in place and the bills were paid ahead of time. So um, paying after the fact is the way to go, not before the goods are delivered. All right, thank you. And finally to you, Mr. Boyles, uh, what additional oversight, if any, would you like to see county commissioners exercise uh, to achieve that appropriate supervision and control over the TDC? This problem originated well before Mr. Bellinger. This problem originated when there was a personality conflict and the county commissioners made the decision to remove direct oversight of that uh, position from underneath the county administrator and by virtue lost many of the controls that Okaloosa County currently has in place for all its other departments. I've met personally with our purchasing director and we have a very robust system in place and I'm going to make sure that we move um, that department back under the purview of both our county administrator and our, and our purchasing department and make sure that we're following those procedures that are in place for everybody else and that the TDC does not receive any special treatment with regard to um, its expenditures uh, any different than any other county department. All right, thank you gentlemen. All right, and as we head into question four, a good time perhaps to remind you that the questions we are posing to the candidates for the next three nights have been compiled by the League of Women Voters at the Pensacola Bay Area, and for tonight's purposes for the Okaloosa County League of Women, uh, League of Women Voters. And now we are at question four, and this one is posed first to Mr. Smith this time. What role do you believe the county should play in dealing with the numbers of homeless people in Okaloosa County? I think it's, uh, this is a very important issue uh, with uh, both uh, uh, your, your home, homeless population and but uh, your, uh, your unemployed homeless population and your employed ho homeless population. Uh, this is where you need to uh, reach out and, and uh, coordinate with your uh, with your uh, civic groups, uh, church organizations, and bring those groups in with county government and to support those issues and. Uh, give as, as good a support to those uh, individuals as you possibly can. All right, thank you. And the question now is posed to Mr. Aiden. What role do you believe the county should play in dealing with the issue of uh, the homeless population in Okaloosa County? Well, I agree that the uh, church involvement, other civic organizations, but I uh, should be uh, brought into bear and brought into play on this, but I don't believe it is the, the duty of our county to invest a high amount of dollars in that. Um, you know, that, that's a problem that can manifest itself and continue to grow. And uh, I don't think that, that we are in a position to financially support the homeless. Um, you know, churches and civic organizations do a good job of that, and I hope that they continue to do so. All right, and the question now to Mr. Boyles. When it comes to the issue of the homeless uh, population in Okaloosa County, what role do you believe the county should play in this? Your county commission, um, like many other matters, needs to take a leadership role with this, this type of issue. We have to get stakeholders to the table. That includes uh, the municipalities that are affected. I know Fort Walton Beach in particular is affected by this issue. The Okaloosa County Sheriff's Department, which is an independent constitutional officer, has to, has to come to the table. And so I believe your commission's primary role is to play a leadership um, uh, responsibilities and getting those folks to the table and developing a plan uh, to rely on those those services that are provided, uh, non-governmental services that are provided by many great agencies to help rebuild that, that safety net without the use of public funds, which will get those folks uh, out of that homeless situation and get them back into the workforce and uh, productive members of our community. All right, thank you. And finally, the question now to you, Mr. Reeves. What role do you believe the county should play in dealing with the numbers of homeless persons in Okaloosa County? Well, as a Fort Meade City Councilman, I've dealt with this for the last six years that I've been on council, and uh, I think that there needs to be more of a partnership with the county. I, I have found that, that, that there is some support from the county, but not enough, and I would like to see, I know how it directly impacts my business. It's located in downtown Fort Walton Beach in a negative way. Anything we can do to enhance that public-private partnerships or whatever we can do to, 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 
to stem the problem of homelessness. Um, obviously, none of us want families on the street. Uh, we, we, we definitely need to break it into two issues, vagrancy, that people that choose to live that way, and also the, uh, the families that are out there making sure that they're covered in some way. Uh, I think that there definitely needs to be more of a partnership so that we can make that happen. All right, thank you. All right, we are now up to the fifth and final question for our Okaloosa County Commission District 3 candidates. And for this final question, we will start again with you, Mr. Aiden. Uh, the question is, where do you stand on the frequently made recommendation that the local gasoline tax should be increased temporarily with the added revenue earmarked for county road maintenance or other transportation needs? Uh, I'm not in favor of any tax increase at this time. Uh, I, particularly, we have the Restore Act coming down. That's going to bring a large boon to the county, 65 to $150 million that will be accessible to that. Um, we, we can use that money for county road work. I would like to see us try to get government help to, to match our funds that we do contribute using the Restore Act uh, and, and use that in lieu of a, a gasoline tax. I'm not in favor of any tax increase. All right, thank you. And Mr. Boyles, uh, the question to you, where do you stand on the frequently made recommendation that the local gasoline tax should be increased temporarily with that added revenue earmarked for county road maintenance or other transportation needs? I drive a Durango. <clears throat> I think it's a terrible idea. I just think that right now is not the right time to be piling on additional uh, burdens on our citizens at gas uh, prices. Uh, they may have uh, they may have lightened up slightly recently, but I don't know that that's any indicator that that's in fact going to be the case. And I don't think that we can uh, add additional uh, burden to our citizens. Uh, transportation infrastructure is a, a big issue. It's an important issue to me with my engineering background. But I think we have to find creative ways to work within the means that we currently have to, to meet those challenges and not look to uh, supplement revenues at this point in time. All right, thank you, Mr. Reeves. To you, where do you stand on the calls uh, for raising the local gasoline tax temporarily? It's on about the second page of the budget. It sounds easy to, when you have a problem, to just ask for more money to fix that problem. You have to look inside that budget and find some more dollars because in the north end of the county, that Okaloosa County is broken into two, a south end primarily broken up by Eglin Air Force Base in the north end, the North End is clearly concerned about transportation issues and they want to be funded just with more money, ask for more fees to, to strap on the taxpayer. Right now I still think we have to look within the budget. I think the money is in there somewhere uh, to find it, to shift it around, to, to make it happen within what you already have. I would not support a, a half a cent sales tax based on that. All right, thank you. Finally to you, Mr. Smith, uh, your stance on recommendations to increase the local gasoline tax. Uh, at, at this time, with the price of gas, I could not support an increase in the uh, in the gas tax. I, everybody asks, why is gas cheaper in another county or when you go across the state line? The reason it's cheaper there is because the additional taxes we already have on our on our on our gas. Uh, we, uh, as stated earlier, we need to learn to live within our means and do the best we possibly can and most efficiently with the with the money that we have. All right, thank you, and thanks uh, to all of our candidates. That completes the question and answer session for County Commission District 3. And now each candidate in the County Commission District 3 race will have 45 seconds to deliver a closing statement, and we are going to begin the closing statements with you, Mr. Boyles. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for having us tonight. Um, I, I, I have the, the energy, the experience, and the education to lead Okaloosa County forward and give a fresh perspective on our Okaloosa County Commission. I, my background was uh, as an engineer. I went to school to be a civil engineer, and from there I went to law school. When I finished law school, I came back, and my wife and I uh, renovated a small building in downtown Crestview, and that's where I've had my law practice ever since. We have a young child. We, we live in North Okaloosa County. We're absolutely committed to this community. And we want to participate and we want to make Okaloosa County to be as great a place for my child to live as it was for me. Uh, and, and I look forward to the opportunity to do that uh, as your next County Commissioner for District 3. And I hope that I can have your support on August the 14th. Nathan Boyles, B-O-Y-L-E-S, candidate for County Commissioner, District 3. All right. Thank you, Mr. Boyles. And next we go to Mr. Reeves. Uh, 45 seconds for your closing. Great. Thank you. I want to thank the League and WSERE for having us tonight. I, uh, many of you know that I'm a small business owner in downtown Fort Walton Beach. That's kind of the core of my, my uh, wanting to run for and serve in a public office. I'm a two-term city council member. I think that I bring the experience that's needed to make the decisions for the 
for the vote for the citizen of Okaloosa County. Uh, it's at my real core as I've never voted for a tax increase as an elected official. I can stand on the record that I have at, the, at Fort Walton Beach City Council. And I ask you that you support me and vote for me on August 14th for your candidate for Okaloosa County Commissioner. I will do an honest job and a good job, I think. And thank you for having me tonight. All right, thank you, Mr. Reeves. And now, Mr. Smith, 45 seconds for your closing statement. Thank you. My name is Bill Smith. I am your candidate for County Commission District 3 in Okaloosa County. Uh, speaking with voters is always a real privilege, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as I talk to people around the county during the campaign, there's three issues. Uh, creating better jobs for our young people, holding the line on taxes while uh, not affecting our quality of life and protecting our senior citizens. Uh, I've served on the Niceville City Council. I've served in government. I've also served in other appointed positions. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of the F-35. I've been had the opportunity to, to be the, uh, serve as the honorary commander for both the 53rd and the uh, uh, 33rd Tactical Fighter Wing. And I would appreciate you if you would go to uh, my website at electbillsmith.com and uh, vote August 14th Bill Smith for County Commission District 3. All right, thank you, Mr. Smith. And uh, uh, finally tonight, we will hear from Mr. Aiden. 45 seconds for your closing. Well, I appreciate the League of Women Voters having us out tonight. Uh, my business background is in mortgage lending as well as construction and development. I've been in small business, been in the private sector since I graduated. I'm a lifelong resident of Okaloosa County. Uh, graduated from Sanford University with a degree in business management and finance. And my primary focus, if I'm elected, would be to cut the budget, reduce that budget by 5% per year for the next three years, uh, simplify the budget, that's another key component so that all citizens can understand the, our budget, which is cumbersome at this point, and get in there and work with the, big, the, the largest 10 departments and get our hands dirty and see what we need to do to fix this county, and I can do that. Go to electclinaden.com. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Those were the candidates for County Commission District 3 here on Rally 2012. And in case you're just joining us, I'm Sandra Averhart. And I'm Drexel Gilbert. And this is night one of three nights of primary election coverage on WSRE, during which time you have the opportunity to hear from candidates in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties, as we are now just three weeks away from the August 14th primary. The next slate of candidates comes to us from the County Commission District 5 race in Okaloosa County, which, Sandra, is yet another of these universal races. All voters in Okaloosa County are eligible to cast ballots in this race. There are four Republican candidates in the race for County Commission District 5, and uh, once again, they are seated alphabetically for us tonight, and we are going to begin introducing them to you now. The first candidate is Felix Buchenkamp, and he is from Niceville. Welcome, Mr. Buchenkamp. Good evening. And next to him is candidate Joe Fagundes. That's correct. Thank you, Drexel. Thank you. And uh, he is from Destin. Niceville. Niceville. Candidate Larry Hines is up on your screen now, and you, Mr. Hines, are from Destin. Yes, ma'am. And sitting next to you is Kelly Wines, also a Destin resident. And gentlemen, welcome this evening, and uh, we're glad that you're here to have this opportunity for the voters to have the opportunity to hear your views on certain issues. Gentlemen, I'm going to be asking each of you five questions, and you will have 45 seconds then to respond. Then at the conclusion of the questions and answers, you will each have 45 seconds to make your closing statement. And we are going to begin tonight with question one, going to you first, Mr. Buchenkamp. What would you recommend that the county do to attract employers who can offer jobs that match the range of skills, training, and education of county residents? Very good question, thank you. Um, well, as a businessman, uh, for the last 35 years uh, and 25 of those years, 28 of those years in Okaloosa County, I'm somewhat familiar with uh, starting uh, new businesses and creating jobs. Uh, for one, simple rule, stay out of the way. Uh, my basic philosophy is uh, less government is the best government. But what I have found by going to a number of different uh, seminars and organizations where we have talked about attracting businesses is, is uh, talking about giving permits, getting permits for building new businesses, whether it's a building or a runway or a roadway. Uh, that seems to be the log jam that we see in other areas of the state. So a quick permitting process, which we have in Okaloosa County, is what I would pr promote. 
All right, thank you. And the first question for this race goes now to you, Mr. Fagundes. What would you recommend that the county do to attract employers who can offer jobs that match the range of skills, training, and education of county residents? Well, I think it's quite evident, and, and I agree with Mr. Buchenkamp on this, that we, county government needs to get out of the way. We need to make uh, the process a lot easier, a lot quicker, uh, to have shovel-ready products. We have a great uh, asset in Crestview, which is the Bob Sykes Airport. It's a transportation hub. We have rail and interstate that run uh, right through the middle of it. So we've got the location. We've got the quality of life. We've got the education in the schools. Uh, what we need to do is, is find businesses that are interested in moving to paradise. And uh, we need to go out and actively recruit them. There are obviously a number of different ways you can do that, that whether it be tax abatement or, uh, or just helping them uh, uh, build out a location that, that works for them at, at a place like Bob Sykes Airport. All right, thank you. And now the question goes to Mr. Hines. Obviously, jobs a big uh, issue, and uh, we would like to know what your thoughts are on attracting employers to Okaloosa County who can offer jobs that match the range of skills and education and training of residents of Okaloosa County. Well, I would increase the focus on high-tech industry. As a businessman, I founded a, a, a software company, and we grew that company over an 11-year period. And the way you do that is you attract the employees of that company uh, to come here. It's an intellectual property issue. You don't need real estate for a software company. And they can operate out of a, a, a rented a, a garage, literally. Uh, you go out and you find the software companies that, that are looking for a nice place to live like Okaloosa County where we have the beach and the perfect weather. And you attract, you, you talk to that company owner and you talk to the employees and you offer incentives for the employees to move here and you will be able to build your high-tech industry in Okaloosa County. All right, thank you, Mr. Hines. And now to you, Mr. Wines, as uh, you are seeking this seat, what thoughts do you have on attracting employers to Okaloosa County that can match the skills and the education and the training of the residents who live in your county? Well, I'm, I'm a limited guy also. I, I think that uh, we've all heard that old adage about uh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. The government uh, can help in some cases, but the best thing they can do is, is keep your regulations to a, a minimum, keep the fees to a minimum, uh, basically step out of the way and let, let business flourish whenever they can. We need to emphasize our, uh, our assets in our community, our beaches, our, our, uh, our climate. Uh, it is a paradise that we live in, and let's make that known. All right, thank you very much. And it's time now for the second question to be posed to these candidates. If revenue shortfalls demand additional spending cuts, what are your top priorities for further trimming? And this question goes first to Mr. Fagundes. Thank you. You know, right now we need to look uh, in, in our county, uh, we've had five years of declining revenues. First thing we need to look at is waste. And uh, we, we've seen a lot of it. We've seen some, some bad things happen. Uh, but, but quite frankly, we need to really attack the, uh, the waste factor in it and the redundancy of operations within the county itself. Um, there are lots of areas, the 911 call centers, um, you know, the, the fleet management is going to be a big issue uh, coming up. Uh, so, so waste is the, is the prime uh, area that I think we can go after. And, and there's 5 to 10 percent built into the budget now that, that I think we could really go after and make a change. All right, thank you. The question now goes to you, Mr. Hines. If uh, revenue shortfalls do demand additional cuts, what are your thoughts on uh, prioritizing and, and for your further trimming? I would focus in three areas. Uh, these are primarily uh, consolidation related. I would look at the emergency call center operations that the county has. The, uh, we have four police departments in, in, the, in the county, uh, Niceville, Crestview, and Fort Walton Beach. We could look at consolidating uh, the call centers that they have with the, with the county, and that would save everybody money. I would look at consolidating the way the county handles their uh, medical insurance for their employees, get a bigger buy, so to speak, more employees in the pool. And I would look at purchasing as another way to consolidate, let all the municipalities and the county buy things together, buy by bulk, and you'll get a cheaper price. All right, thank you. And the question goes to you now, Mr. Wines. If revenue shortfalls do demand additional spending cuts, what are your priorities for further and future trimming? Well, I agree that, and I'm sure everybody up here will agree, there's some consolidation in order. Uh, purchasing is a good place to look. Uh, I'd look at the, uh, 
the vehicles, maintenance of the vehicles within the different parts, uh, different departments. Uh, I, I, I'm not in favor of uh, owning quite so many buildings. I don't know if we can't privatize some of these uh, services that, that, that now the county owns. And uh, also we, we're holding too much real estate that's not being utilized. We need to, as soon as the market comes back, not in a down market like they tried to do recently, but get rid of some of that excess real estate and that'll help our, our bottom line. All right, thank you. And finally, the question goes to you, Mr. Buchenkamp. If there are revenue shortfalls that do demand d additional cuts, what are your priorities for trimming? Great question, and thank you. And this is exactly why I'm running, uh, because our $261 million budget, which just got reduced to $257 million with this present budget cycle, is not enough. Uh, about two years ago, our county administrator retained the services of a group called the Institute for Senior Professionals. And uh, that group came up with $10 million worth of savings just by going around to the uh, various department heads. We have over 20 departments in our county government. And I feel that we have more savings that we can be found. And here's how. One is efficiency through technology, the use of technology. We're all walking around with smartphones. We can use iPads to uh, improve our efficiency. The other is duplication. Our water and sewer department, for example, has an information technology department, but we have an information systems department. There's duplication there. All and right. there's more ideas. Okay, thank you very much. Now, gentlemen, we have a follow-up to that question. As revenues fall, what ideas do you have for providing necessary maintenance and replacement for the county's aging infrastructure? And this time, the question goes first to candidate Wine, or Hines. I'm sorry, candidate Hines. Well, we've addressed this uh, problem in, in the city of Destin, where we had an aging fleet, and we looked at, uh, we compared their mileage, uh, what they did. Uh, the functions they were under. We uh, decided to do things like uh, store them inside more, uh, maintain them internally more. Uh, the aging fleet, it's, it's going to have to be solved eventually. We're going to have to invest. The county's going to have to invest in, in, in replacement vehicles. You can buy replacement vehicles, uh, uh, used vehicles. Uh, that's some solutions to the, the aging vehicle problem. Okay, all right, thank you. And now the question goes to Mr. Wines, and I'll uh, repeat this as a follow-up uh, to our previous question about the revenue shortfalls that is anticipated. Uh, what ideas do you have for providing necessary maintenance and replacement of the county's aging infrastructure? Uh, infrastructure in the way of vehicles, is that, is that the question? I, that's <laughs> your interpretation. <laughs> well, if you're talking about pure infrastructure like stormwater and, and such as that, water and sewer and all, the, uh, the restore funds are going to help considerably with that. I anticipate quite a bit of money being um, utilized for that. If you're talking about vehicles, uh, you get back to the uh, consolidation effect that I mentioned earlier where we can get these departments together. And uh, in some places we can do with a few uh, lesser number of vehicles and that's, that's, they've been cutting back some. I know in the Sheriff's Department it can be done in other areas as well, I believe. All right, thank you. And the question now goes to you, Mr. Buchenkamp. As uh, a follow-up to the previous question regarding the anticipated revenue shortfalls, uh, what ideas would you have for providing the necessary maintenance and replacement if necessary for the county's aging infrastructure? My, uh, my campaign platform has been uh, to keep the footprint of government the same, to improve efficiency through technology, and to have an eye for the future, plan for the future. I'm a planning commissioner presently in Okaloosa County, and uh, my thought is, is that we need to have a, a renewed, every year, a one-year strategic plan, a five-year medium-range plan, and a ten-year long-range plan. We're not doing that. And we need to look at what our priorities are. We have a $55 million unfunded mandate, for example, for stormwater improvements in the county, and we don't have no funding for it. We need to have a community discussion on how to best raise money for that. It could come from the Restore Act. It could come from uh, matching grants. It could come from a uh, special assessment, but these are issues that need to be listed, prioritized, and then dealt with. All right, thank you. And finally, to you, Mr. Fagundes, as uh, revenue falls, what ideas and thoughts do you have about providing the necessary maintenance and replacement of the county's aging infrastructure? Well, the first thing we can't do is count on the Restore Act to, to solve all of our problems, and we certainly don't need to be treated as a budget uh, 
a budget item that's going straight into the budget because it, it could be years before that comes out. We do have some infrastructure issues. Obviously, you've heard about the stormwater. Uh, I, I don't believe we need to go down the stormwater, stormwater utility uh, enterprise fund uh, path. I think that we have to take a hard look at, at where and, and what is most aid, uh, aged and, and what is deteriorating the fastest and we have to prioritize them. And it's gonna take the community, it's gonna take the municipalities, and it's gonna take the county government with a vision to work through those items and get to, the, get to the where we can solve the problem. All right, thank you. And if you are just now joining us, you are watching Rally 2012 on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. I'm Drexel Gilbert, I'm joined tonight with Sandra Everhart, and we are introducing uh, you to candidates in the races and several races in the primary election for Okaloosa County. This is the first of three nights that Rally 12 will be here on WSRE and we certainly hope that you will join us uh, for the remaining two nights as well. Mm -hmm. The questions we are posing to the candidates tonight have been compiled by the League of Women Voters from the Pensacola Bay Area and also from Okaloosa County. Right now we are posing questions to the candidates for District 5 and County Commission the County Commission race in Okaloosa County. And we are at question four now. And this question, which will go to you first, Mr. Wines, with the D Tourism Development Council in the news recently, some letters to the editor have called for the abolishment of that council and for the elimination of the bed tax. What is your response to those suggestions? Well, for many, many years, the TDC has done a good job. We, we had big trouble here recently, but I uh, would not be in favor of abolishing the, the TDC because in order to have the bed tax, you got to have the TDC in place. Uh, if, we, if we lost that tax revenue in the county, it would probably up the ad valorem tax on the average citizen between five and 10%. Uh, the TDC does a lot of things that we would have to, uh, we would have to do out of our budget, such as clean the beaches, lifeguards, uh, plant sea oats, it goes on and on. So I'm definitely in favor of keeping the TDC with some more, some new checks and balances and, uh, and, and let's look at the organization of it. All right, thank you. Mr. Buchenkamp, the question now goes to you. With the Tourism Development Council in the news recently, some letters to the editor have suggested that uh, the council should be abolished and that the bed tax should be eliminated as well. What is your response to those suggestions? Well, one of the reasons why I'm running for county commissioner is I believe that we need new leadership and strong leadership in the commission. That's what I intend to provide. The other is, is that we, uh, as commissioners, represent the people of the county. And we should listen to all viewpoints and then make a judgment as to what the best course is for the greatest good. Uh, with regard to the Tourist Development Council, I think eliminating the tax at this point would only provide our, our neighboring counties uh, with a comparative competitive advantage. Uh, they would love that for that and, and they would attract more tourists. It works. Uh, the collection of the tax is not the problem, it's the spending of the tax. We've implemented some uh, as a reaction, unfortunately, not planning for the future, but we've implemented some measures to prevent that kind of abuse. I intend to use those same measures in other areas. All well. right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And now we move to you, Mr. Fagundes, and the question again I will read uh, to you. With the Tourism Development Council in the news recently, some letters to the editor have suggested abolishing the council and also eliminating the bed tax. And uh, tonight we are asking for your response to those suggestions. Well, you know, I don't think we can eliminate it right away. The convention center falls underneath it. The bed tax pays for it. It pays for a number of other, uh, the lifeguard safety, the beach cleanup. So there's a lot of things that it actually contributes. And actually just this week, uh, the, the TDC was able to pay maintenance back to the county for the parks for the parks on the south end of the county. So there are some some unique circumstances that keep it around. I think as we go forward, though, we need to involve more citizens. We need to have more input from the people that actually collect the tax, so that we're doing things with the money. Not only are we controlling them and 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 having a complete and total oversight of it, but that we're doing things with the money that enrich the quality of life that it can provide. It can be things uh, like the Frank Brown Park down in Panama City Beach. We don't have anything like that in Okaloosa County, and it's an option. All right, thank you. And finally, the question now goes to you, uh, Mr. Hines. With the Tourism Development Council making news recently, some have written in to the um, written letters to the editor and, and have actually suggested abolishing the council and eliminating the bed tax. And tonight we ask, uh, as the candidate, your uh, opinion on those suggestions. Well, the tourists through the bed tax pay for some very important things that everybody, I think, in Oklahoma County would, su would support. Uh, lifeguards, for example, are paid for by the TDC funds. 
And in 2013, that's going to be about a million dollars uh, for our beaches. The TDC pays for cleaning the beaches. That's about three quarters of a million dollars. It also helps pay for a turtle watch program that's required by the federal government, uh, testing on the water quality in, in the bays, uh, cleaning our parks. So the TDC is a very important function. Legally, if you collect bed taxes, you have to have a TDC. So I would be in favor of keeping the TDC. The county commissioners have already made some very important changes in the way the TDC is managed. Uh, and that uh, will take care of the problem of the mismanagement that happened before. All right, thank you. And we are now down to the last question for this race, County Commission District 5. And uh, we are going to begin back at the beginning with Mr. Buchenkamp and ask you this last question. How satisfied are you with the county's parks and recreation programs and policies? And if you, are, if you believe there should be improvements and changes, what would those improvements and changes be? Well, we have one of the greatest areas of recreation in all of the country. I think that's why a lot of us moved here. I moved here 30 years ago almost uh, from Ohio with my wife and my three young children. Um, and one of the greatest benefits we have is all the open areas that we do have. I think one of the problems we have with the Okaloosa County Parks is letting people know about them. And it's, it's, it's not an uh, expensive problem. It's um, one of communication and using uh, the bully pulpit, if you will, as a county commissioner or as a county administrator to advertise and let people know where those parks are. I live in the city of Niceville or in, in the greater area of Niceville. We have wonderful parks there that people use uh, all the time. Uh, so it's just a matter of letting people know uh, about the parks and promoting them. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Fagundes, the question to you now, how satisfied are you with the county's parks and recreation system and policies? If you believe that there's room for change, what changes would you make? Well, I, I think first off, we, we are fortunate that we have so many state parks in Okaloosa County. We have uh, city and uh, city parks in Niceville and the Children's Park and, and you know there's a new dog park now in Destin and you know so there, there's there is some activity there I think we can do a lot more and I think we need to utilize uh, a, a vision and and the ability to use maybe some TDC funds in the future to really make a difference that would not build the parks that would draw people in that would enrich the lives of, of everyone that lives there because we would be able to participate and use those parks also so I think there's always room to grow uh, and, and make those better for everybody because it just makes it a, a better place to live. All right, thank you. And now uh, to you, Mr. Hines, your opinion on Okaloosa County's parks and recreations system and also the programs and the policies and if you believe there's room for change, what are your ideas? Well, we have a lot of parks in our county, not only county parks, but city parks. Uh, we're very fortunate in that respect. I'd like to see us have more parks, especially uh, north of the Air Force Base. There's a lot of property there that could be acquired at a reasonable price, and we could uh, acquire that property and build parks there. Um, I'd like to see more parks where people can go spend the night. We don't have many of those. So as a commissioner, I would be uh, placing a higher priority on investing in the acquisition of property for parks and uh, putting infrastructure in them, including playground equipment and things like that that the children can come use. All right, thank you. And Mr. Wines, finally, the question to you goes tonight, the last question of the evening. Uh, your thoughts on Okaloosa County's parks and recreations programs and policies. And if you believe that uh, there is a need for change, tell us what your thoughts are tonight. I think the park system's in pretty good shape. Uh, in talking with citizens around the county, uh, the few complaints that I get is, uh, particularly on the beachfront parks, that uh, the parking is is lacking the uh, some of the access to get to the beach is lacking and I think if we could improve it in that area uh, make it more accessible to the people we could cut down on those uh, complaints and we'd be in real good shape all right thank you and thanks to all of the candidates in the race for County Commission District 5 in Okaloosa County and now each of these candidates will have 45 seconds to make a closing statement and we are going to begin the closing statements now with Mr. Fagundes Thank you tonight to the League of Women Voters. Thank you, WSRE, for having us, Drexel, for the questioning. You know, I'm Joe Fagundis. I am your candidate for District 5 County Commissioner. I moved my family here in 2006 because of the quality of life, because of the schools, because of the business opportunity, and because of our church. I, I certainly want to bring to the County Commissioner a new level of integrity, a new, letter, new, new level of accountability. Uh, 
And, and I want to get us back to the, where it's county business and not just county government so that we're not mirroring what's going on at the federal to state level. We need to take care of the county residents, of uh, the taxpayers and the voters of Okaloosa County, and they need to be our number one priority, not the department heads. It's about taking care of our residents and lowering their taxes, keeping them low, and providing the services at a high level. All right, thank you. And now 45 seconds for your closing statement, Mr. Hines. Well, I'm Larry Hines, and I'm proud to be running as your county commissioner. As your commissioner, I will be uh, taking advantage of my experience as a 20-year Air Force veteran, as a pilot, and a businessman. I'll be making decisions that are best for you and all of Okaloosa County. I retired in 2003, and as a retiree, I'll be able to be a full-time county commissioner. Unlike my opponents who have family businesses to run and manage, I'll be working just for you and trying to make the decisions that are best just for us. Please vote for Larry Hines on August the 14th. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Hines. And now we go to Mr. Wines, for who has 45 seconds for his closing statement. Thank you. Well, I've lived here longer than any of the candidates, all the candidates, as a matter of fact. I've been in business longer than any of the candidates here. I think that gives me a little bit better perspective. I know the history and traditions of the county. Uh, over the years in business, uh, in private sector and municipal, I served on the city council in Destin for four years. My strengths have been bringing lots of little people together to do some big things. We did it with the Fisherman's Co-op, we did it with the Destin Fishing Fleet Marina, and uh, you just got to uh, be able to do some certain skills like compromise, negotiate, you got to be a good listener, you got to be able to build consensus, you got to show leadership skills and be firm on your decision making. Uh, these qualities have been proven over the last uh, 40 years or so, and I'd like to bring them to the County Commission. All right, thank you. And finally now, 45 seconds for your closing statement, Mr. Buchenkamp. Hi, I'm Felix Buchenkamp, and I want your vote on August the 14th, and here's why. Nancy, my wife, and I uh, have lived here for almost 30, almost 30 years, and we've brought up our four daughters. Uh, we have three granddaughters here in Niceville, and uh, we care deeply about our county and its future. I believe that I provi can provide you all with the right mix of uh, education, business experience, and community activity volunteerism. I've uh, been involved with five major organizations from Habitat for Humanity to, to the Mental Health Association to the Workforce Development Board. I'm a planning commissioner. I know how to think about the future. I know a little bit about technology and efficiency. And I plan to represent you on the Board of County Commissioner and, and be your spokesman. Please vote for Felix Buchenkamp, August 14th, and thank you. Thank you. And those were the candidates for County Commission District 5 in Okaloosa County. And Sandra, we are now heading into the last race of the evening. And Drexel, that last race tonight is for School Board District 4. This is a nonpartisan race, and there are three candidates seeking this office. Now, unlike the universal races, which are decided by plurality, the winner of this race must get 50% of the vote plus one to win outright. And if none of the candidates get that 50% plus one in the primary, then the top two vote getters will move on to a runoff in the general election. And now it's time to meet our candidates and, of course, moving in alphabetical order. The first candidate this evening is Rob English. And Rob, uh, welcome this evening. Thank you. Our second candidate is J.B. Witten, and uh, welcome to you as well. Good evening. Thank you. As we mentioned, there is a third candidate in this race, and she is Catherine Thigpen. She was unable to attend Rally 2012 or 2012 this evening. So, gentlemen, uh, welcome again, and we'll just uh, begin with you. And the first question tonight will go to Mr. English, and it is, and again, uh, these questions come from the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa County. 45 seconds for your responses. Mr. English, to what extent should teacher pay be based on student test performance? Well, I don't believe that uh, teacher pay should be based at all on student testing because teachers can't control the entire environment for the student. Um, Teachers can't make a student study, they can't make them read the lesson, they can't make them uh, do their homework. As a teacher in Okaloosa County, I found that out pretty quickly. Uh, so I do not believe that student testing is necessarily uh, 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 the tool that we ought to use 
to actually grade teachers. Now that's not to say that you can't use you know, over a period of time how students perform. I think that's very important how your students perform and it does reflect something about the instruction given. But as far as using the test directly, not so sure about that one. All right, Mr. Wooden, to what extent do you think teacher pay should be based on student test performance? Uh, I believe it should be used to a very little extent. If you look at the system we're developing here in Okaloosa County, it takes 171 pages just to explain the evaluation system we're using for the teachers. And a lot of that is comprised of formulas built around the student performance. And as a teacher, uh, I wasn't able to control all those factors. Not only that, but you're comparing teachers of different subjects, different levels, different students, uh, different economic levels from the schools that they're teaching. So ultimately, uh, the control that teachers have over individual student testing is very, very minimal. And so to tie their evaluation, which essentially ties a pay to that, is not a good method as far as I'm concerned. All right, our second question will go first to Mr. Witten. Uh, given adequate resources, what additional steps would you recommend for keeping the school district competitive in attracting and retaining highly qualified teachers? Uh, well, one thing we can do is we can support the contracts that we already have with our teachers. This, uh, this last school year, we had a contract that guaranteed a step increase to our teachers. That's in addition to the salaries. They've got no increase in the salaries. A step increase is based on their experience level. And although it was in the end of a three-year contract, the school district said they couldn't come up with the money to pay, and the school board uh, endorsed that uh, decision. I disagree with that. I think that teachers don't need a whole lot. A step increase sometimes, just that little bit of money, is enough of a compliment for them to hang in there. All right, Mr. English, your response. Uh, what additional steps do you recommend for uh, keeping the school district competitive and attracting and retaining qualified teachers? I think the first thing we need to do is uh, find some leadership that will treat their people with respect. Right now, I think teachers and staff are extremely demoralized. Uh, part of it is the, the step pay that uh, Mr. Witten is talking about, but part of it is also the way they are treated. Having taught in the school system, uh, I can say that we would probably benefit from uh, leadership that one treats their people with respect, that uh, executes their jobs ethically. Currently, I have an ethics complaint against the incumbent for using school personnel, government employees, to accomplish political activities, and I see that as a clear conflict of interest and most people do too. All right, our third question will go first to Mr. English and it is, what do you consider the appropriate relationship between the public school system and children who are homeschooled? Well, I'm one of the, probably one of the few candidates that uh, have homeschooled our children. We've, we've had our uh, children homeschooled. My, my wife stayed home while I was in the uh, military. We've had uh, our children go to private schools, and we also have done the public school system. Uh, two of my boys graduated from Crestview High. So we've seen the gamut of a lot of the education that's available out there. I would support homeschooling. I think if a parent chooses to do homeschooling, I think the education sh system should support that. I think choice is important for parents, and uh, if they want to homeschool or they want to send their uh, child to a private school, I think our education system should support that. All right, thank you. Mr. Witten, to you, what do you consider the appropriate relationship between the public school system and children who are homeschooled? Well, I think the school district has an obligation to support homeschooling, uh, and that is to allow the students to come to the school and take classes that the parents may not be capable of teaching. We have to have a screening process. We have to evaluate the students being homeschooled. I've done that uh, when I taught. I evaluated a family did that because not all parents are capable of homeschooling. They believe they are, but they, they really aren't. But the key is, is that we can't do what we were doing the last 10 years in this district. We were putting up a little school in the North County, a little school in the South County, letting the homeschool students come in there and supporting them that way. We were operating that at a loss Accommodating them, yes, but they always have the right to come to our schools anyway, so we didn't need to do that. All right, this next question to our Okaloosa School Board District 4 candidates. Uh, end of course test exams may be expensive, stressful, and considered by some to be 
uh, an impediment to effective use of class time. What is your opinion on whether the use of these tests is justified in spite of such potentially negative aspects? And we start with uh, Mr. Witten. Thank you. Well, um, and of course, examinations are fine if they're measuring what the student learned in a particular class, but to be using it in place of an EPCAT, which is essentially where the state of Florida is going, uh, I don't agree with that because it's just going to become another glorified all-stakes test. So yes, have the end, of course, but you have to administer it properly, not the way we did it this year in Okaloosa County. We outsourced it, let another county develop the test, uh, tweak the test, change the test, administered it to our students as guinea pigs and then had to change 24,000 grades because it was a completely uh, invalid test. So I believe in them and they should count as part of your course grade, but they shouldn't become an all-stakes test in a replacement of the FCAT. All right, thank you. And to you, Mr. English, your opinion on whether the use of these end-of-course tests are justified or is justified in spite of the negative aspects potentially? I have no problem with end-of-course testing. I think uh, as a college professor teaching at Crestview High, uh, I gave finals, basically, which is an end-of-course test. I think that's fine. Uh, as Mr. Witten talked about, the end-of-course debacle that was caused by our leadership in Okaloosa County uh, created problems that didn't need to be created. I won't go over what Mr. Witten talked about, but uh, you can go to my website and read about some of that. Um, I think we do too much practice for the testing that raise uh, anxiety. Uh, teach the course, take the test, whether it be FCAT or end of course testing. Teach the course, take the test. Make sure the tests are valid and reliable, but it's pretty simple. All right, our final question this evening uh, will go first to you, Mr. English. What is your response to the charge that there is too much emphasis on testing in the schools today and overuse of these tests for rating student, teacher, and uh, school performance? Again, I think uh, basically the end of course tests or having a standardized test is not the problem. The problem is the continuous uh, emphasis on, those, on the, those tests and continuous practicing for those tests. I think you just teach the course and take the test. I just common sense, simple type stuff. You know, when you teach a college course, you teach the course and you take the test. And that's what we used to do when we were young. You teach the course and you take the test. It's, it's kind of simple. If you build it up into something that it really isn't, now you create a lot of anxiety in the students. And uh, if, you, if you have the debacle with the end of course exams that we had, it creates more problems. All right, and finally to you, Mr. Witten, your thoughts on the overuse of tests for rating students, teachers, and schools? Well, uh, we don't need to do it. What we've done is uh, we become subject to money given to us by the federal government. The Department of Education, which is an overblown $70 billion budget a year, uh, is not responsible for education by the Constitution. It should be our state government. But what they do is they take our tax money and then they bribe us by saying if you don't comply with our standards, no child left behind, you don't get any of your money back. Well, part of the no child left behind becomes the teacher evaluations, the, uh, the FCATs, all these other things, all these hoops we're jumping through. What we need to do is put the control of our education back where it belongs, and that is at the, at the district level, the school board level not at the state and the federal government level. All right, thank you. Now 45 seconds for our candidates for their closing statements, and we begin with you, Mr. Witten. Well, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you all for hosting us this evening. I am J.B. Witten, and I'm a candidate for District 4, Okaloosa County School Board. As an Air Force retiree and a uh, prior teacher, and currently a community volunteer, I want to improve our school board. Right now, I don't see any checks and balances between the school board and the school district. I don't see enough public discussion on issues before they're voted on and accepted by the school board. I want to see better decisions. We don't end up with no pay increases, I mean, no step increases for our teachers or the debacle we had at end of course examinations. I would like to see less interference by the federal and the state government. And definitely I would like to see term limits on the Okaloosa County School Board. And right now we had one individual who's been there since 1994 once since 98, and my opponent, the incumbent since 2000, 
I want right, to be a fresh you. set of eyes thank on the school board. Thank you, Mr. Witten. And now, Mr. English, your closing remarks. Good evening. I am Rob English, and I'm running for school board. Please go to my website, rob-english.com. That's rob-english.com for detailed information. Let me close by reading a letter that one of my students uh, put in my mailbox as a teacher. Mr. English, this is my first year having you as a teacher, but you substituted for my classes for the past couple years. All that time, I didn't understand why you were so strict. But now that I have you as a teacher, I get it now and I appreciate it. You want your students to succeed and you have made me want to succeed. Being in your class has helped me realize that I want to be a pilot in the Air Force. Thank you for the opportunities you have presented me with. And that's exactly right. I want our education system to succeed and I'm not sure where we need to be. Thank All you. Right. All right, thank you. Our final race of the night candidates for Okaloosa County School Board District 4. All right, uh, that is going to do it for tonight for Rally 2012, but we have two more nights of exciting primary election coverage. Tomorrow night we are going to be meeting candidates for political seats in Santa Rosa County. You see the races there, Clerk of the Court, County Commission Districts 1, 3, and 5, School Board Districts 2 and 4, the race for Sheriff, Superintendent of Schools, and Supervisor of Elections. And Drexel on Thursday night, candidates for several state races and also candidates for seats in Escambia County will be in the WSRE studios. And of course, we hope that you will join us again right here on WSRE TV as we continue with Rally 2012. Our thanks, by the way, to the League of Women Voters for their participation in this program. We hope to uh, you will join us again tomorrow at 7 p.m.